All right. Hi, I'm Claire, and welcome to Book Break. I am a librarian here at the Greece Public Library, and today I am thrilled to welcome two very special guests, author Angie Kim and author Etoff Rome, both of whom had their books as our community reads for our Greece Reads program. Both Angie and Etoff currently have published their second novels to great acclaim, Angie's book, Happiness Falls, features neurodiverse characters in a family with a Korean immigrant mother and a white dad trying to solve a mystery of a disappearing father. Etoff's book called Evil Eye begins with the message of a family curse and then flashes forward to a young woman experiencing job troubles, marriage issues, and identity issues in her North Carolina town. Both novels represent the best of literary fiction, and I love them both. I am so happy to welcome Etoff and Angie today. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Claire. I'm, I loved the Grease Reads program, and I'm so excited to be back talking with you. And I love being here with Etoff because our first books came out like around the same time. And we bonded, and I'm just so happy that our books are out together again. Yes. I'm, yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Grease Reads was one of my favorite gatherings. I still remember all the conversations that we had with the readers and all the pictures that we took. And some of them still email me till today expressing just how much fun they had and how they continue to tune in and read more books. So I'm just really honored to be here. And I'm so glad that I'm with Angie, who is one of my dear friends and I'm just really excited. So thank you for having us. That's so also, I'm so jealous that you got to do it yours in person because remember Claire, like when, when uh, Miracle Creek was a Grease Reads pick, it was during the pandemic. So, right. we had to do, you know, and it was great virtually, but I was just like, I want to be there. I, I wish I could. So I'm, I'm jealous. Etoff. Maybe, maybe we'll have you back in the future. Cause yes, I, Etoff was our first one that we had in person um and that was so exciting it it really is it's great virtually but in person it was just phenomenal so yeah it really i still wear my t-shirt so claire gave me one of the t-shirts and it has angie it actually has your book on it because it had i think i was the third read uh -huh. and so it says angie kim Miracle Creek, and then it says Eat Time for a Woman is No Man on the back. And I wear it everywhere. And people stop and say, What's what are those books? And then I I stop and I give them a whole entire rundown of the books. And so it's been really fun taking that with me here. So I'm just grateful. That is so cool. And Claire, now I'm jealous even more. And I want one of those shirts. So okay. you and I are talking afterward. <laughs> And you both had bookmarks, so you're famous, like in books all over, you know, Rochester, New York. So <laughs> I love my bookmark. So one thing I wanted to start with is you guys definitely do have some similarities. Um, you both had immigrant parents. You both had your debuts in 2019. Both were celebrity book club picks. Um, autobiographical elements in both of your stories. Great cover art, by the way, too. Um, how difficult was it to write your second novels after such a very successful debut? I don't care who goes first. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so just a quick correction. So mine was not a celebrate. Miracle Creek was not a celebrity book club pick, but E Tufts was. And I and I we were just talking about how when she found out, like we were screaming over the phone. Remember that E Tuff? I was remember. So cool. Um, but yeah, but yeah, I feel like it was really really hard because my first book. It was the first book I even ever tried to write. So I'm actually in my little writing closet. And I'm looking at the sign above my head that says this is not a novel that I put up there as a reminder to myself that when I was writing Miracle Creek, there was no expectation of this being an, being, you know, like out in the world. So I could feel I should feel free to experiment and do whatever I wanted. And I still have that sign up. And my husband came in when I was writing Happiness Falls and he was like, uh, honey, that sign that says this is not a novel. Hate to tell you this, but it is a novel. It has to be a novel because you sold it. So I sold this book on 
uh, as a partial on 60 pages and a three page pitch. And I had an editor waiting for it. I had a deadline. And that was really just psychologically hard. And also it was during the pandemic. So it, it I feel like it just really played with my anxieties and insecurities a lot. What about you, Itaf? Oh, man, it's actually really interesting to hear you share that. Thank you for being so vulnerable about the process, because I also felt that writing my second novel was insanely hard. Um, the reason why it was so hard was because when I wrote A Woman Is No Man, like you, I didn't have any expectations of myself other than feeling this need to articulate myself in a way where I felt safe, which was on paper. And if anyone, if you haven't read A Woman Is No Man, it's the story of three generations of Palestinian Americans. So my only intention with that novel was to kind of understand my own history and my own background as a Palestinian American. And obviously I had dreams like we all do of getting published and finding an editor, finding a, maybe hitting a few lists. Those are dreams that I, I, I think all writers have in the back of their mind, but it was still something that I didn't know if it would happen. But with Evil Eye, it, it had already happened. You know, I, I, I had already achieved success by publishing industry's terms, and I didn't really know how that happened. And immediately after I started writing Evil Eye, so I felt really scared that I was a one-hit wonder. I felt that it was also during the pandemic, and I was really isolated, and Evil Eye really delves into very dark topics of mental illness and isolation and and finding your true self even when no one around you sees you or believes in you and I I was struggling with those things personally and so I felt like it was just harder to write from a personal perspective I felt like I was suffocating but you know we made it we did it we're yeah, here we did it we did it and one of the things if I if I can just go uh, sorry Claire I'm just gonna yeah. Just because I've been talking about this a lot, because um, one of the issues that my book deals with is the father who's missing, we've come to find out is obsessed with ideas of happiness, quantifying mm -hmm. it and trying to maximize it. So he has all these theories that are related to expectations. And so I've been and what I mean, it's it, kind of in a nutshell, his theory is that um your happiness level is um, your experience divided by your expectations. And then like one of his kids is kind of like, but you know, the problem with that is that if you keep your expectations low to try to be happier tomorrow. So like, if you tell yourself like, my book's going to suck and nobody's going to buy it. And it's going to be like get horrible reviews. When you get like good reviews, you might be happier because your expectations were so low to begin with. But boy, in the meantime, you're going to, it's going to suck. You do want to have those expectations. You want to have the hopes and you want to have the dreams and you want to have the silly daydreams and fantasies and, you know, like, and enjoy that too, because that's part of the experience too. So what the dad does and Itaf, I did this so much is he starts to focus less on ex and on expectations and more on your baseline. What is your baseline conception of yourself that you are comparing all of your experiences to? So I've been like having those hopes and expectations for happiness falls, but like telling myself, you know, the baseline of me is that person who started writing in my 40s, having no idea if I was going to find an agent, having no idea if I was going to actually, you know, have any of my books finished, less, let alone sold and, you know, with beautiful covers and stuff. So just the act of holding this finished book in my hand, even before any reviews or anything, I had to remind myself that compared against that baseline, I have what I desperately wanted already. Like, you know, and it's such a good reminder, you know, so that's how I've been keeping myself sane through everything. <laughs> Same. That on similar lines, I can totally agree with that. It's just a reminder. I remind myself constantly whether or not I hit my goals, which I'm a big, big dreamer. And I dream really, really big. And sometimes it comes to bite me because I literally believe I can achieve anything. Yeah. And then when it doesn't happen, I'm like, but I thought that it's supposed to happen. Um, but I just remind myself, this it's such a privilege to be here. It's such a yeah. privilege to be able to practice our, our art, to share our stories, 
and to touch people, even if it's just one person, that alone is huge. And that's that to me is what keeps me sane. The reminder, if I can just help one person, then that's enough for me. Absolutely. I think you both incorporate a lot of your own stories and your backgrounds in your novels. Do you feel like you really enjoy putting that into your your books or would you rather like sometimes just do to something totally different? I'll, I'll start this one, Angie, to give you. So this is actually a good question that I've been asking myself a lot, especially since writing Evil Eye. I realized that as a Palestinian American, I'm drawn to stories about Palestinian Americans or about women who are coming from limited conservative communities because that's my experience. And I think at one point while writing Evil Eye, I was upset with myself because I didn't wanna write another novel that was inspired by my upbringing, like A Woman Is No Man Was. And I thought, and I was telling myself, you know, it doesn't have to be inspired by your upbringing. You can write something completely different. Why don't, why don't we write a thriller? Why don't we write, you know, go away from the sad, deep thought provoking stories about trauma and, and and minority voices but i i couldn't go away from those stories because those stories are who i am and mm-hmm. present a large portion of my community who is underrepresented and unseen and who do not have stories that advocate on their behalf so i think w- what i really settled the conclusion that I've come to is that I need to use my experiences and my voice in order to tell these stories and that there's no shame in that. And another, another piece that echoes with that is evil eye is about a sheltered artist, a woman who wants to be an artist, but has come from a sheltered community, a woman who felt like she didn't really have access to art growing up. So even when she dreams of becoming an artist, She feels very naive doing so because it's not like she's traveled and explored the world and seen art for herself. She hasn't. And so I address this in my novel, too, the idea of communities and individuals who do not have access to art but want to create it. How how do they create it when they're sheltered from it, when they when they are when they do not have the privilege of having the access to it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I. Felt like that myself like I kind of I grew up very sheltered and so I'm not as cultured as most people are and yet I want to create art and the art is going to be about my sheltered background and that's okay that doesn't make it any less moving and any less important no and in fact to me that makes it more inspiring you know and it makes it more universal and accessible you know because there are so many people in communities that are like that That's so amazing. Thank you. Um, What about you? Yeah. So I think for me, I, in both of my stories, in both Miracle Creek and in Happiness Falls, I think I incorporate my own experience as an immigrant and, um, you know, various aspects of that. But I also juxtapose it against my experience that I had as a mother of, you know, children who are all fine now, but who had lots of medical issues. And so that feeling of being an outsider and the experiences that are sort of both uh, in both sort of of those contexts and sort of, and by comparing and contrasting, I feel like I can make sense of it for myself. And I think one of the reasons why I put my own experiences into my, into my stories is that I write and I am inspired to write when I can't figure something out when something perplexes me when something maddens me and infuriates me and I don't understand it so then I write in order to try to figure out you know how I feel about it and to really interrogate it um and make sense of it and so um you know in this novel one of the things that I'm most concerned with is an experience that I had as an immigrant is you know coming here as an 11 year old in middle school and then and then feeling like I went from being a smart girl who had lots of friends and who could speak to the next day not being able to speak any English and as a result not only being frustrated but really ashamed 
you know, that sense of feeling like a pavo, like a, a really stupid person and being treated that way and feeling that way myself. And so interrogating this notion of that's very deeply seated in our society of why, why do we equate oral fluency with intelligence? whether it be because you're an immigrant or because you have aphasia or apraxia or autism or Angelman syndrome and you cannot speak or can't speak in the same way that like, you know, those fast talking characters on the West Wing speak, you know, who are supposed to be like the pinnacle of intelligence. Like, why do we have that assumption as a society? And I've been grappling with that my entire life because I am like, so insecure and i think it comes from that experience of losing all faith in myself and all sense of confidence and competence because i couldn't speak the language why is that so important to us you know and so that's one of the things that i was just like well in order to figure this out and i'm not sure that i've already you know figured it out but still i'm you know i tried to do it is i need to write about it and that because that's how i sort of like sort out what I th truly think about something. And I think that's why I incorporate my experiences because these are the, these lingering questions that I have that I have to work out through writing. That was, the I one, hope that, Oh, sorry. That was I the one thing that impressed me is that was the theme I got is that we equate intelligence with speech. And it really made me think about just the way I've interacted with people and the way we treat people of different cultures because they, they don't speak English, and um, the way you use the angel man syndrome, like I had never heard of that, and then yeah. to use it to kind of spread that message was awesome. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Claire. I'm sorry, Etaf. <laughs> no, you're okay. I was. I wanted to tell Angie that I hope that this process of finding her voice overcoming herself and writing these two beautiful novels was able to help you feel more secure in yourself. I understand I understand how childhood impacts, your childhood impacts you even as an adult, despite the reality that you are successful. Sometimes we can't escape that little girl inside. So I just wanted you to know that you deserve to feel secure in yourself and that you've accomplished really great things and that we're all really proud of you. Oh, thank you, Etoff. That's such a great message. And yeah, I try to tell myself that my husband tells me and we tell each other things like that, too, because I see that same vulnerability in your writing, too, Etoff. And, you know, and I think it's actually by talking like this, especially in the literary community, which, you know, you and I both came onto the scene we didn't have MFAs. I don't think you, did you have an MFA? You didn't, right? So we were no. both kind of like outsiders in some ways. I never wrote anything before. Like that right. was both the first thing that we've ever written, I remember. Yeah. And so I feel like having a community of people like that, that we can reach out to and sort of like cling on to really helps me. So I really appreciate you saying that, Itaf. So how did you guys... It sounds like you definitely met each other and knew each other when your debut novels came out. So do they have like writing circles? Does your publicist do this? Like, how do you find each other? Angie I, came out. I'll let you tell the story, Angie. No, you. Did. Well, so I came out when she was in D.C. for a uh, lit on H Street, right? Remember yeah. with um, with two of my favorite people in the DC literary community, um, Jamise Harper and uh, Lupita Aquino, and um, and sh and I, my book was about to come out, and I wanted to go hear her because I had read it and I loved A Woman Is No Man, and so I like went as a fan. And I think we had interacted a little bit on Instagram. I did not think that she would even know who I was. But when I walked in, I think you like waved and you like you introduced me to the crowd, which was incredibly generous because my book hadn't come out yet. Nobody knew like who I was or Miracle Creek or anything. And it was just so amazing. Oh, my God. I love that moment. I just get chills thinking of that moment still. I love that moment, too. And then we went and we grabbed dinner or appetizers afterwards and we got to know each other she told me about miracle creek and her process i told her about a woman is no man and 
we instantly connected because of our immigrant experiences and the fact that as women of color, we really hope to spread light through our works in the same way. And I think that's kind of the basis of our bond. So yeah. Yeah. Exciting. it feels full circle because it wasn't planned or orchestrated for us to be on Grease Reads. So the minute I heard that, oh, it's going to be you and Angie, I was like, oh, yeah, that'll be so fun. Oh, my God. I have been looking forward to this so much because it just it's it really does seem like our books resonate. Um, with some of the same people with some of the same themes and stuff so I just feel like given that that wonderful introduction that we got to each other that it feels like so cool that also that our books are coming out like they were coming out at the same time they came out within a week of each other yeah and I remember, Ita, if your book was supposed to come out, I think, way earlier, and mine was supposed to come out way later. And through this weird confluence of events, like both our books started, like came out in the same week. It was awesome. Yeah, it really is. I'm so I'm so excited. It's it's an exciting time for both of us now, and I hope that you're enjoying every second of it. You too. Yeah. So what do you, either one of you have like one event in in your publishing career that you're either most proud of or that really made an impact for you? Ooh. One. Wow. I love yeah. for me. That's a hard question because my events, I love second to my writing process. You know, I love the the fact the my routine and discipline with writing. I think that brings me great healing and catharsis. But second to that, I would say the events have been incredible. I love connecting with readers and connecting with authors and artists. The most recent one I can think of was going to the Dallas Museum of Art for Evil Eye. And just the intelligent readers and the audience and my wonderful artist friend, who introduced me and did an interview with me, Mariam Obag was amazing. She she like went to the heart of the novel and really helped me be vulnerable on stage and open up in a way that I don't think I had ever opened up before. I felt really seen and just connecting with everyone afterwards when they, you know, when they came to buy books and and get it signed. It was just so I can't say one event, but that's the most recent one because I just, I had it last week. So I just wanted to give a shout out to the Dallas Museum of Art for having me. Oh. Yeah, I like Itaf, love events. Um, I love, I love talking about my books, about other people's books, being in conversation with other authors. Um, I love big events, like huge fairs and, you know, like seeing 350 people like hold up copies of my book that's awesome but at the same time I love going to um y last night I went to my first book club for happiness falls which was like eight people in you know somebody's like living room and it was my first one and I did like over 250 for miracle creek and I love those intimate conversations and so um so I love all of them but I have to okay so this isn't really an event per se but the day after my pub day for Happiness Falls, um, because Happiness Falls was a Good Morning America pick, um, the day so the day after um, we had this cool thing where Juju Chang, who was the anchor who introduced my book the er, the earlier day, she came down to the D.C. area. And we did a taped interview, but what made it really special, um, and it's going to air this Friday, so on the 22nd, I'm so excited to see it, is that I teach um, creative writing to non-speaking students. <gasps> and she came, and they taped a class. And I can't tell you how special it was. It was unbelievable. Um, because you could see these people, not only Juju Chang, but like all the camera crews and the producers who were there, you could see their, like, it just everything lighting up. I really, some of them started tearing up. I mean, it was unbelievable when you see people who, you know, and most of my students are autistic and they've been labeled as 
quote unquote, low functioning, quote unquote, nonverbal autistic, which just infuriates me. Um, just the judgment and the bias that goes into that. And so they have been assumed all their lives to have no thoughts, to not be able to write or read or certainly, you know, they can't speak or some of them speak, but they script, you know, so they like um, are echolalic and things like, so they can't use speech to express their deepest thoughts. And to see people who are acting in this way and they were clearly all very nervous because they knew what a huge moment this was. And I, so the taught, the prompt that I gave them was, Let's talk about how you're feeling. So write what you're feeling, but using all the senses, not just, you know, like sight and what you're hearing, like, mo you know, a lot of writers tend to do. But we've been really working on, you know, using all the senses like taste and, you know, the, you, you're, the way that your in, inner organs feel like all of that kind of stuff and um, and smell. And they wrote some of the most heartbreaking, amazingly gorgeous just things that just came out of them so the way they communicate is by using um a letter board that's held in front of them and pointing to the letters one by one and so it's a painstakingly slow process but the they were the crew they were so patient and juju actually like started scribing so when they were like you know pointing to the letters she was she wrote them down and i mean it was unbelievable some of the things that they said, and I can't wait for everybody to see it. It was so meaningful to me, and it's so meaningful to them and to the organization, to the therapy center. Um, so I'm just, that has to be the top thing that I've done. Yeah. Wow. Oh, man, that's inspiring. I, that's the top thing for me to listen to. So that that's so inspiring, Angie. I'm so proud of you. Oh, thank you. I mean, I'm so I was so proud of my students because they really kept it together. Some of them like are have so much anxiety that in a regular class, they they like escape the room like they can't even like one of them that he like tears his shirt sometimes. And they were calm and they were so nervous and they talked about how nervous they were. And they wrote about it. But I mean, they just they were amazing. It was seriously. And it was so amazing that um juju actually said that she was um she's gonna do a longer segment uh oh, i'm just so excited it's so cool yeah your book definitely brought you know that whole nonverbal and how people communicate and it's it's obvious when i read the book that you had a lot of experience with that so it's cool to see that you've been volunteering and now i can see why you have the expertise to write what you did so yeah, thank you. Yeah. And and a couple of them have been in, well, actually one person has been in conversation with me for my DC launch and then again for my Northern Virginia launch. And oh, and Etoff. So my moderators were Lupita for my DC <gasps> launch and then Jamise for my Northern Virginia one. So it was like total full circle moment. It was I amazing. Love Jamise, they're so what they do for the community and for books. It's outstanding. I love them so much. That's exciting. Yeah, so cool. So do you guys often read like other books or has there been a book that you've read recently that you just can't stop thinking about or that resonated with you? Like what's on your nightstand right now? Oh, let me grab it. The latest book that I read was The Leftover Woman. Ooh, Ooh, yay! Such a great book about identity, motherhood, chasing your dreams, and like listening to your intuition and finding your own voice. So I resonated with all of those themes and it was just such a brilliant book. And it comes out in October, I believe. Yes, it does. But October yeah, 10th. Have a look out for it. Such a beautiful book. So just shout out to Jean. Her, her books are always so beautiful. But this one really touched me. So shout out to her and her book. Make sure you add it to your TBR. Oh, I will. I read her first one, Searching for, is it Sylvie Lee or? Searching for Sylvie Lee. Yeah. That was her, yeah, that was her last one. That was actually her third book. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. So Jean and I actually wrote our book side by side, kind of. Um, we were we, we were in the same writing group and we we exchanged pages weekly during that murky middle to try to keep each other going. Um, uh, I, yeah, it's such a beautiful book. Um, what am I reading? So I'm reading a book right now that comes out today. Um, oh. and I'm trying to see if I have it. No, because I, I don't, I think it's because it's actually on my nightstand. I don't want to, but, um, it is Daniel Mason's North Woods and it's linked stories and it's just breathtaking. It's just, it takes place. It's all these linked stories that are, um, linked by the fact that they're all stories told by the inhabitants of this one cabin in or house um, building in the in the woods in Massachusetts. And um, and they span centuries and they're told in really cool forms. So like one is like song lyrics and then one is like regular, you know, story form. It's just it reminds me a little bit of um, Jennifer Egan's um, uh, Goon Squad that way. Mm -hmm. And so so I just love that. And it's just so beautiful. Yeah. So I'm, I'm still in the middle of it. I haven't finished it, but it's just gorgeous. And it comes out today. Well, I have that one on from NetGalley. And I'm, my daughter gets married this coming weekend in Massachusetts. So maybe that'll be my, my read since I'm headed up that way. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So what is the one message that you really hope that people take from each of your books? One, that's kind of hard. Well, that's you could you <laughs> could do more than one, but like the major thing, the major theme. Well, for Evil Eye, the theme is how to detach ourselves recognize and be aware of old narratives and old beliefs that are holding us back that that old internal voice that's programmed into us from childhood and i was writing a novel about a curse a family curse and centered it a lot a, a lot on superstition in this family and as i got deeper and deeper into the novel i realized that the curse was actually these old beliefs that we can't let go of and that once we once we recognize and, and are aware that we live a lot of our life on autopilot and are very limited by what we think we can and can't do because of the way that we were raised, once we recognize that, we can be much more empowered and find a way out of that cycle, not just for us, but for the sake of the next generation. I think so your, that's, your character, Yara, used... Well, she used art, but also journaling. Do you like to use journaling to kind of help you through those moments? or? Yeah, well, I think when, when there's a lot of trauma that needs to be uncovered and healed from, sometimes articulating it is very difficult. And so art, journaling, meditation, those are things that can help quiet our mind and help us access those emotions and feelings that we don't want to sit with that we repress and that the entire novel is about a lady and about a young woman who is repressing her emotions and have has repressed them for so long and journaling then becomes the only way she can really dig deep enough to articulate what those emotions really are and to face them head on and so as a writer and someone that also has dealt with trauma i i do think that journaling is 100% something I would encourage for anyone who really doesn't even know where to start. You know, it's just a way to get your emotions on paper. I've been, lately I've been doing morning pages. Um, Julia Cameron recommended morning pages. I as love a, morning pages. As a way to just like clear your mind. And many artists use them to help spur their creativity or even to just face their day with less baggage, internal baggage, to quiet that that incessant mind chatter that we all have and we carry with us. So I would definitely recommend journaling to anyone who just wants to really tune into themselves to figure out how to break free from the things that are holding them back. What is a morning page? That's the first time I've, I've heard that. So Julia Cameron came up with this technique where every morning you wake up 
And before you do anything, you have to fill three pages with writing. And it's not tailored for writers, it's tailored for anyone. So artists, uh, uh, athletes, it's the, the point of the pages. In fact, if you're a writer, it might hinder you because you might try to write the three pages as opposed to do the three pages, which is getting three pages of words out of you. Thoughts, anything random, what you ate for dinner last night, uh, what you're afraid of, what what your intentions are for the day, what you what you in, your goals are, what you think that you failed or done miserably at, anything at all that is taking up space in your mind, you fill three pages with it every day. And so many athletes, artists, uh, businessmen, lawyers, doctors, it's for everyone really, mm-hmm. have leading those three pages daily consistently has helped them expand and be more connected with themselves and tap into their spirituality and in a and in a sense tap into that divine aspect of themselves which helps them then attain more flow in whatever they do in their life whether it's whatever career they have so i've started doing those recently and i don't know where those morning pages have been all my life i think they would have probably brought me closer to myself much sooner, but I'm very grateful to have stumbled upon the book. It's actually right here. It's called The Artist's Way, The Artist's Way by by Julia Cameron. I actually, I'm about to gift this to someone, so I actually got another copy, but it's life-changing. It's a life-changing book. Okay. Thank you. I use, yeah, I use it too. I love it. Yeah. I, I'm very bad at doing the date with myself. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. But- yeah, so I have to do I have to get better about that. And I've also not been doing morning pages and I'm actually going to start um I think this weekend. Um I, I I've just been too overwhelmed with events and stuff, but I'm like at a point where I'm like, okay. I am I I have like two and a half more months of it, like touring left and I can't not write. I miss it too much. I just it makes me it makes me depressed actually not to sort of be creating and writing. And so I'm going to start with morning pages and that's going to get me going. Cause it always does. Yay. I'm glad. Yeah. Well, you guys, I can't even tell you how much I appreciate you visiting with me and sharing your thoughts about your books. Um, we're so proud of you here at the library to see that your second novels have come out and, gotten such a claim because we loved your first one so um thank you so much for joining me today is there anything else that uh you've got coming up that you're excited to talk about or you're going to take a little break for a while (laughs) um no i mean i'm taking a little break from writing but hoping to get back to it soon um but i do have a ton of events coming up so Um, For people who are listening from outside the community, would love if you would go to my website, um, angiekimbooks.com, and go to the events page, and, you know, would love to meet you. Sounds good. Same for me. If any is in an area where I'll be doing events, I'd love to meet you guys. Head over to my website or my Instagram and Facebook, and... You can see my tour events. Hopefully I can connect with more new readers. That's always my favorite. Well, awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Thank you so much for for having me. This has been such a pleasure. And yes, you need to. Why don't you make me and Etoff sort of your joint community read at some point and we can come back and do it with um with each other that would be like the best thing oh i would love that so much yeah but thank you so much for for having me for this wonderful chance to connect um with you and the readers and also with etoff i'm so excited to talk to you more etoff yay I am too, Claire. I'm so grateful that you've allowed us to share our stories and tell anyone who hasn't had a chance to read our works, what our works are about and giving us this platform. So I really appreciate you and thank you for having us on Grease Reads. And I definitely will come to any event you invite me to, especially if Angie's there. I'm really looking forward to it. All right. Definitely. Same.
Well, thank you so much, you guys. Have a good rest of your day. And thanks, everyone, for listening to this special edition of Book Break. We'll see you next time. Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library, made possible through the support of the friends of the Greece Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.